Welcome to One Planet Conservation Awareness. And today we're very excited to be talking about the launch of our latest fundraiser, Plant for Hornbills. One Planet Conservation Awareness is working very closely with Shabazz from One Stop Borneo to help support his mission to replant some of the primary forests of Borneo. So Shabazz, thanks for joining us. Could you just give us a bit of an intro to what Plant for Hornbills is? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Jordan for, for this opportunity. So Plan for Hornbills is basically a project where we are going to reconnect uh, around four fragmented forests. Most of them are primary national, uh, primary rainforests and national parks, but uh, some of the smaller fragmented parks are also reserves, but they're so isolated. You know, we are afraid the, the gene, the, the genetics of the animal and, you know, the, a lot of animals are not moving out of the park uh, and they're just staying in one place and it's not very, you know, good for them. So the idea is to reconnect uh, uh, these four fragmented forests by planting figs, uh, fruiting figs. These are the wild figs, not the edible figs you get in Europe in the States. These are the wild figs, which are loved by animals. So that's the idea. That's what's planned for hornbill. So hornbill favorite foods we're going to replant. So we've got some pockets of the primary forest full of biodiversity, but they're, they're fragmented. They're kind of become islands um, surrounded by palm oil and, and development, human development. So the idea of planting these trees is to connect them together so animals can move and the genetics can move in between the different sections. Is that right? That's right. You know, most of it is palm oil. There is a bit of soft foods, but then there's uh, uh, some degraded uh, land as well. But mostly it's palm oil. And um, uh, that's what we want to uh, uh, reconnect with. And, and what actually is the process of, you know, plant for hornbills? Because it's not as simple as just buying a tree and putting it into the ground. What, what is the process? What are you guys doing on the ground to, to make this um, so, work? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's not just what you see on on the newspaper. Somebody planted a tree. There's a tree ready made to get that seedling or young, yeah, young, young, young seed, which we're about a tree, which we're going to plant. There's a lot of processes involved. First of all, we have to find the the tree or a fruit which are which hornbills are eating. So usually we follow gibbons in hornbills, and whenever we find a fruiting tree, we collect the seeds. After we collect the seeds. We try to, oh, the fruit, sorry, the fruit. After we get the fruit, we try to sieve it under a tap uh, water and then we just get the pure seeds. After we get the pure seeds, we try to prepare the soil. Now we try to either cook the soil or we try to sieve it or we try to do both. We cook the soil to kick, kill the fungus sometimes, you know, because that can kill the young um, seedlings. So we try to put these seeds in the tray, water a few times a day. And that's one way of growing the seed. And once the three, the three or four true leaves come out, we can transplant them from the tray to the poly bag, wait another month or so, and then plant in the ground. That's one of the processes. Another, the, the advantage of this one is you can grow maybe hundreds, but the disadvantage is the mortality is high too, but the seedling is usually healthier. Uh, but the other way which we're doing is mar coating, which is basically we take an existing tree an existing branch, we cut open a, a little bit of the side of the branch, put the soil, close it, and we're basically fooling the tree. The roots will come up after a few, few weeks. Then we cut that and then we plant that. So I think you'll see that in the videos as well uh, soon. Uh, and that's how we try to grow the trees in our nursery. It's, it's um, labor intensive. Yeah, definitely. And you have a few different methods of how, how you have to grow um, these trees. Yes. Uh, but people might ask at home, why are you only planting fig trees? Because, of course, people realize that, you know, to have a healthy ecosystem, you need to have diversity. Um, so what's the idea behind planting fig trees in particular? OK, first of all, uh, figs is a family, you know, so it's not just one species. We are planting at least 25, 30 different species of figs and all of them can grow from you know, different shapes and sizes. So there is a diversity there. Number two, the figs which we are planting, 
are the ones which we know are loved by animals already. They're animal favorite foods, which we saw ourselves, filmed ourselves. So we can we can tell you that and assure you that and if they do grow and they do fruit, this is, animals are gonna love it. Number three, actually we're gonna be planting 95% figs and 5% other hardwood trees as well. So we will have a bit of diversity, but the idea is we attract the animals from the parks when the figs are fruiting and the animals when they come over from the parks let's say the civets and the squirrels or so on the birds they will bring in the you know you know the other trees as well when they poo you know when they when, through their feces other tree species they will plant it themselves you know naturally so in a way we let the animals plant you know and uh, what they want in a way you know so that's the idea of the figs so really by planting these figs you're enabling the ecosystem to you know continue its services you're allowing these species who some some of them are often called the gardeners of the forest but they've been able to eat different seeds from different trees come and poop them out so by you're kind of enticing them in to eat the figs um in your in our corridors and then when these animals move on they're going to be planting their own trees elsewhere as well and bringing in the diversity exactly what are you spot on you know you did it a more simplified way so you know let's say you have the two fragmented forests and full of figs in between and animals will slowly one day will just you know move from one park to the other easily and slowly and slowly the flora other kind of flora will come back naturally on its own we're just speeding up the process by just planting you know it's like a bait you know and the rest we let the well, we let the nature do its uh, thing so we're actually making our life a bit easier as well <laughs> absolutely so by so by planting the these trees are actually it's kind of twofold because you're planting the trees increasing diversity but then it's bringing in more of the animals which they themselves can increase the biodiversity as well so we've yeah, mentioned right. a few of these species you know civets and squirrels and obviously hornbills where the name comes from but can you Talk to us a little bit about the different species in the area and what what species might be able to benefit from this project. So I think this is my personal opinion. I think almost all animals will benefit from primates like orangutans, gibbons, you know, the langurs and uh, clouded leopards, marble cats, you know, porcupines. I think everything is going to benefit. Because once there's uh, lots of pigs and fruit, it's going to create lots of animals coming in. Let's say deers and pigs come in eating the fallen fruit. Once there's deers and pigs, the clouded leopards and the reticulated pythons, they might get in, you know, curious, okay, there's some prey over there. They'll go in there too, you know? And I, I think it's going to benefit all kinds of animals, but figs are keystone species. They're loved by everybody. They're loved by pigeons. They're loved by, you know, the bats. They are bat figs, figs which are loved by only bats, you know? The other primates and you know, mammals and birds, they don't eat it, only bats eat them. So I think it will benefit everybody. You know, we'll be planting bat figs, we'll be planting uh, gibbon favorite figs, we'll be planting helmeted hornbill figs. But then, like I said, uh, it's going to benefit everything from deers to the predators as well. I th yeah. And in the terms of rewilding, which has become a bit of a buzzword in conservation at the moment, in this sense, we're not really trying to bring species into a new area. These species and these ecosystems are already there, it's just they've become isolated. So the idea right. is we, we can connect them together to get that flow of energy and the flow of genetics moving in between um, these little pockets of biodiversity as well. Yes, for, for example, Tawa Hills Park, where we are based in, it has 338 species of birds, 105 species of mammals, 84 species of frogs, almost 52 species of snakes, and thousands of species of insects and so on. So it's really rich in, you know, and really biodiverse. And the other fragmented forests, they're also quite rich actually, but over time, everything is gonna die out because there's just not enough space. So the idea is to just connect these healthy areas. Well, they're healthy for now, but some of them are deteriorating in health. This isn't a new thing for you guys at One Stop Borneo. You've been successful already in a similar project, Plant for Elephants. Can you tell us a little bit about the Plant for Elephants um, project and how it how it's similar to Plant for Hornbills and how, how it differs a little bit as well? The Plant for Borneo Elephants, the, the idea of this uh, project is basically, a uh, long story short, elephants are dying. You hear them all the time in Southeast Asia, either they're shot, poisoned or whatever uh, because of human-animal conflict. 
I'm not going to go into that detail. Uh, so the idea is to, again, reconnect two forest reserves, a 14 kilometer long corridor, and to plant elephant favorite uh, uh, trees, you know, but actually a, a lot of grass, actually, there's a lot of grass being planted as well because elephants love eating grass. So it's just a very green area, you know, so elephants go there more than the plantation, so there's less conflict. So our experience so far in this particular corridor is planting uh, diptocrat, which is hardwood trees, and some fruiting trees as well, and some figs as well. So we have planted, I think, over 1,100 trees. And the idea is for elephants to stay in this corridor more to reduce the conflict and also do a bit of wildlife tourism there. So uh, the only difference I would say between this corridor and the one we're planting now, the plant for hornbills, is in the elephant corridor, it's quite empty, the land. So we are planting from scratch, you know, basically on the ground and everything, a lot of maintenance is involved. In this one, we don't have to plant from the from scratch. We need the existing palm oil trees. We can plant the figs on top of it as well and below it. And the difference is basically we're trying to grow more figs from scratch. So in our plant for hornbills projects, we, we can use the the canopy and the understory that's already provided by the by the palm trees and just make a corridor through the palm oil by increasing the diversity. Now, for people that aren't so clear, when we're talking about corridors, now what size are we talking? We're not talking about you know the corridors we have in our houses. What what constitutes a wildlife corridor? I mean, the plan for Borneo elephants is 14 kilometers long because that's the distance between one park and the other park, and it's between 200 to 800 meters wide. Yeah, that's the land given. Simple. Unfortunately, ideally, it would be better to have the width to be at least a few kilometers, ideally. Uh, the plan for horn bales is around seven kilometers, I would say, and width wise, it's just a few hundred meters as well. So again, this, these are not ideal circumstances. Ideally, it would be nicer to have a few kilometers wide and distance wise, I think five kilometers, three, anything above three kilometers is pretty good. Or even that really doesn't make a difference as long as it connects from A to B, but the important part is the width. The wider it is, the better. The, these corridors, you know, they're, they're not new to the world of conservation. They're, they're approved method of, you know, allowing species to move between different areas. Even here in the UK, technically hedgerows are wildlife corridors allowing our foxes and our birds to move between areas and fields. And across the world now, we're starting to see wildlife bridges and tunnels um, and yeah. roads. So as long as, you know, these are safe passages and the, the, the wildlife starts to trust that these are safe passages, then they will be used. Now, Shabazz, Very true. around the world, lots of people are planting trees at the moment as people are starting to wake up to, you know, the impact of biodiversity loss and climate change. But it, it's starting to become a bit controversial. People are, you know, pumping money into putting seeds in the ground but then who knows what happens to those seeds afterwards. You might plant a thousand seeds, but then they go away, they have their photos and none of the seeds actually grow. So can you tell us what Borneo are going to be doing? And actually the money that people support this project is not going just towards the seed planting. This is a long-term project that's going to involve oh, yes. a lot of research. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the aims of this research? Yes, so there, there are many ways we're going to be uh, utilizing the funds and the way we're going to be planting. Yeah, first of all, the money is going to go in the nursery, the way we, you know, so to the way we can grow the, the figs, either by mark coating or through seeds. Number two, when we do plant them, you know, let's say Jordan, you bought a tree. To, to, be, to be fair, we're not just going to put a newspaper, we planted 10 trees today. We're going to put the person's name. Let's say if you, Jordan, bought one tree, we'll write your name, the date, and maybe a code number, because maybe you bought three trees. So we'll write code, you know, 001, 002. So you know, you know, where did your trees go? You know, so that's how we're going to use the funds and also take photographic evidence as well. Uh, number two, it's not just about planting. You see, we need to get the community involved as well. So we're going to be going to the local schools around. Okay, and we're going to be doing a lot of workshops there as well. And a lot of the kids sometimes they're from families which are not so well off and the parents might be hunting in the forest nearby and they might tell the parents and motivate them, hey, you know, dad and mom, you know, we shouldn't be hunting these animals and so on. And maybe we should stay away from this area as well and let the animals be free. 
and uh, number number two we'll also we also have a rescue service so we'll be releasing some of our wildlife in this area as well and uh, like you said just now if the once animals know this place is not dangerous they'll usually come and they get habituated you know so we will also have full on you know uh, security team as well and volunteers who you know who will be in this area all the time and outsiders would not like to come in this area so the money will be used to cover all the, this uh, aspect so it will be used for many reasons and again like i said we can be reached out whenever there's a question regarding any part of the project you know if they want to say okay where did my money exactly go here 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 proof will always be there and of course people are always welcome to come over and see themselves because uh, the persons who are funding these things they need to be educated themselves and they need to be part of the process not just a newspaper thing they did their part no they need to know exactly what's being planted why it's being planted you know even if you fund another re replanting project around the world in colombia or costa rica or or other parts of malaysia or indonesia you need to ask the team what are you planting why are you planting where did it go so we you know we, you need to be educated in general for these things and not just give your money away just like that. So uh, th at least that's how we will be using our funds. But uh, that's just my piece of advice on on when you fund other places as well. Question that's all exactly this. why we've chosen the method we have to support this project. We're going to be using Patreon um, so people can actually donate their money monthly. So mm -hmm. we've got a link for the Patreon and yesterday we launched um, the site so you guys can go and have a look but we have different tiers so you can um, donate a certain amount of money each month <clears throat> and depending on how much money you give and what tier you're in you're going to receive different resources so on the lower tiers you you can get some wildlife pictures on shabazz's adventures in the jungle the the next tier me and shabazz each month will be you know talking about the biodiversity and the different you know and ecology of the of the forest and the later tiers the more money you give it becomes more personalized so shabazz will give you you know personalized tours of the of the trees and shabazz will be able to um, provide kids clubs and talk to your children about what's going on so by supporting the patreon you're not just giving your money and sort of saying good luck it's going to be an interactive yeah. experience where myself and shabazz will be connecting with you each month and you can really you know you can get something out of this as much as Shabazz and the team do in Borneo as well yes very true so Shabazz as a final message why do you think people should choose to support this project especially around Christmas when lots of charities are you know looking for funding which I'm sure are all great causes but why yes. why should people support plant for home bills i think the the reason the many reasons i don't know how to sum it up in uh, in a simplified sentence but like i said like the park we are based in the bio how biodiverse this place is it'd be a sad to have this place neglected because of the pandemic and again we are not some unique story like you said there's so many other ngos and organizations out there who need help uh, all i can say is we are a group of passionate people we have dedicated our lives you know we are working 24 hours a day you know we have for us a sunday is a monday and uh we we really love all these hornbills and we see them and, and it's just a pity if sometimes we see intrusion here and there and we we, we are just like anybody out there who feels sad when you see de a desert of palm oil as well and you know you feel like you want to do something about it well now we have uh, an opportunity the palm oil plantation wants to collaborate wants to work and is allowing us to plan let's make this effort let's you know let's be Let's be the voice of those voiceless animals, and the future of wildlife is is in our hands. So um, I, I guess uh, my 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 only thing I can say is there's so many amazing animals here, and uh, maybe give it a try, support us, and again you can physically come over one day and see the the support you've given. It's very difficult to answer that because, like you just said, there's so many amazing organizations out there, you know. And we're lucky that actually Shabazz is a very talented uh, photographer and filmographer as well. So throughout this process, we're going to be creating videos and we're actually in the process of creating a, a short documentary about the project where you can really find out more about what's going on, hear the stories of some local people, the palm oil plantation owners, 
Um, so do keep an eye out for that if you're looking for more information. And as yeah, I- already said, if you do have any questions about the project, then do get in touch with One Planet Conservation Awareness. Or if you start to follow One Stop Borneo, you can email Shabazz directly to ask questions about the project. Yes, correct. And uh, I just think like what you said, you know, animals like pangolins, hornbills, orangutans, give us all of them will be benefiting from this project. And hopefully we can document all this and maybe they'll become your favorite animals. Absolutely. Okay, Shabazz, well, we look forward to speaking with you further down the line. And let's hope that this video has acted as a bit of inspiration for people to jump on Patreon and start supporting the project. Thank you so much, Jordan. And thanks, everybody. Thanks for supporting us.